Joanna, I cannot hear you. I don't know if it's just me. That was me. <laughs> okay, so here we go. welcome. Welcome everyone. Um, sorry uh, for the slight delay there. Uh, Luca Ferretti is supposed to be doing the introduction and has the up-to-date introduction, but he uh, his internet just died, which is always great timing. But luckily the internet has not died for our speakers. Um, so welcome everyone to Science of Pandemic Tech. Uh, this is a uh, monthly series, um, basically pandemic uh, science moves really fast. Uh, the pandemic conditions change really fast and we want to inform the uh, community who's working uh, in tech, in public health, what's going on at the science level. And so it's sponsored by uh, University of Oxford Big Data Institute, which Luca would be talking about, and by WeHealth. And we pride ourselves here on really having interdisciplinary discussions. Um, the moderator is not Luca uh, right now, but maybe he'll pick up later. Um, but today's topic is how this was covered app and how it's gone and evaluating it and evaluating it under all the various conditions for, for privacy. Um, and our speakers are uh, Victor Von Veel, uh, from who, uh, from both obviously our speakers. Oh, Luca, you wanna take over? Uh, sure, apologies. Um... So we have two uh, great speakers today, as uh, Joanna probably already told you. One is Victor, who has been the mind behind the evaluation of the Swiss app uh, and one of the people who has done more until now to evaluate uh, uh, COVID-19 exposure notification apps. And uh, it's, uh, it's really cool uh, that uh, we can hear directly from him because of course the Swiss, the Swiss app has been the first uh, uh, exposure notification app uh, ever launched uh, on, uh, on a national scale together with Italy and Latvia probably, but it's okay. Uh, and probably uh, one of the most well-studied ones. And Victor has done a lot of job in, the, in, in, this, in this direction. Uh, also, uh, luckily enough, uh, in, a, in, a, in a role uh, that as assistant professor of digital and mobile health, and so very appropriately, we'll discuss about evaluation of the, of the app. And then we have Marcel Sarté, who is one of the uh, fathers in some sense of digital epidemiology, has been uh, in the field for, for, for a few years. And uh, I think uh, uh, we, we are very looking forward to hear what are his, his feelings on the future of the field and uh, on, uh, on the new developments that uh, will be uh, released hopefully soon uh, for uh, the Swiss app and possibly there will be an inspiration for other apps in around the world. And, and I just uh, want to finally say that we can announce our next uh, seminar at the same time. Uh, just in, we have a date, May 18th, same time in whatever time zones you're in. And uh, we'll be hearing from some, some different approaches taken by the German app. So again, uh, we'll be talking about evaluation of exposure notification, um, but with some different analytics, uh, survey, different survey methodologies and, and so on. Um, so I'll turn it over to, to Victor, I think. Marcel is first. Oh, Marcel, sorry. Yep. Oh, and one more yep. thing before we start, um, please, the chat is disabled for the time being. And can you please place questions in the, the Q&A? And um, yeah, and if you're not anonymous, we might, uh, I might promote you so you can ask them yourself. Good, thank you very much. And yeah, usual question, do you see the slides? Good. Um, thanks very much. Thanks for the invitation. Um, uh, I am certainly happy to be here. I can't speak for Victor, but I think he is as well. Um, w w the way we're going to do this is I'm going to um, I'm going to introduce uh, sort of a bit the background. I'll do this very quickly because some of you may have heard this already. Then we'll switch to Victor, who's sort of um, then looking at the evaluation of the app. Uh, and then I'm quickly taking back over and talk a little bit about possible futures. So um, 
Yeah, so I think we're all on the same page here, right? We're doing digital contact tracing um, for numerous reasons, but surprisingly, um, we sometimes it's forgotten that I guess the main reason is really speed. That's why digital makes sense. It's not just because we like digital, but speed here is really um, of the essence. Um, so we can cut uh, the links um, even to people that have no symptoms yet. And this is important because in the beginning, we just went after contagious, um, symptomatic people. And we thought that would probably do the trick as it did with SARS, but then we very quickly realized it didn't because of that um, asymptomatic uh, or pre-symptomatic transmission. So obviously we have to find, uh, identify those people or you know, not per se identify, but somehow find them and then um, encourage them to, to isolate precautiously, which of, call, of course is what we call quarantine. And we think that's much better because it's a targeted quarantine as opposed to lockdowns, which are the brute force approach if you don't know who's actually at risk. So the way we figured this out in the beginning before this whole project was launched was again, just as a reminder, right? Alice um, goes about her day, uh, eventually she gets infected, um, doesn't notice of course, as these things ha tend to happen. And then a few days later she gets contagious, still doesn't notice and that's the devious um, aspect about this virus. But then a couple of days later, she does notice because she's getting symptomatic, she gets tested and indeed she is positive. So she stays at home in isolation. Now contact tracing obviously kicks in, classical one where people are being um, then contacted that, that she um, recalls having met, but she also has a contact tracing app. So she activates the app and ideally then you go back in time um, and these people will get contacted. And there's these four different cases, right? Where some people will contact it, be contacted, uh, sorry, three different cases. No, four different cases. Some people will be contacted only by the classical contact tracing. Some people will be contacted only by the app. Some people will be contacted by both and some will not be contacted at all. So eventually those that do get contacted here, at least in this thought model, everyone um, plays along and uh, they uh, go into quarantine. And that's a good thing because obviously Alice infected some of these people, but because they've now been at home, they haven't actually passed on the um, disease, the virus. And so we've indeed cut those transmission chains and that's sort of the, the overall goal, right? Now, the way this works also to make it very simple, of course, is phone A um, comes along and sends a signal. In reality, of course, this is much more complex, but for, uh, for the, the argument here, then B comes along and they're in close enough proximity. They make a record of each other on the phone. Same happens with another phone. So it's essentially a logbook where um, everybody sort of makes a, a log of who they've, they've been in contact with anonymously, of course. And all of this, you know, is probably old news by now. We have an understanding that the state is continuously deleted and things are ephemeral and everything stays on the, the device and so on. Good practice. Now, um, we proposed this model and this is, um, this is where things got slightly intense last year when there were essentially two proposals. One was called PEPPT um, and then DP3T split off because um, we felt decentralized was um, was the way to go. And uh, eventually Google and Apple um, said they were gonna um, implement it in that decentralized approach. And that helped us to quickly get things off the road. And um, to set the record straight, I do not think that Switzerland was the first country to do a countrywide rollout, but it was the first country to do a rollout from a um, national health uh, agency. And then other countries were quicker to do it on the entire population. And Switzerland, the Swiss lawmaker decided in the beginning just to do a, a pilot, a one month pilot with a, with a limited number of people. So the challenges there were pretty much everything. Everything was kind of hard <laughs> to get this off the ground. But um, if I would have to say, you know, the things that were easy and things that were harder. And 
easy was actually for us was getting the right people together to work on this. And this is the benefit of, of being able to, to have interdisciplinary collaborations already set up where you have years of experience of working with one another, in this case, epidemiologists and computer scientists. And so you build these bridges over time. And so when the storm comes or the flood in this case, you don't have to spend valuable time building bridges and trying to understand each other, but you can just walk across it. What was much harder was um, convincing everyone else that these centrals the way to go. And there were some intense uh, days and weeks at the time where um, I think everybody tried to influence, especially of course the, the OS uh, makers uh, to go one way or the other. Um, it was uh, then relatively easy building the app. I mean, it's straightforward, right? Um, but it was then uh, harder to get the legal framework in place. And that also put a bit of a damp in the beginning, at least in Switzerland. But I think um, it was the right thing to do because eventually um, we could really start with a proper legal framework. And then also easy, right, in some sense, um, was making the app work technically. I mean, I'm not saying any of this was a walk in the park, but it was straightforward. And the hard part, and I, I think you'll hear more from that in Victor's talk, was making the non-technical processes around it work, where we probably overestimated the technical um, process capability of, of the public health system we thought you know things like handing out codes to activate the app was something trivial and it turned out to be something much much harder that delayed um, the epidemiological impact of the app quite a bit now before i hand over one of the ways um you know we can talk about this forever but to me the intense moment and i hope we can take this forward in the coming years as we will build more and more technology right and luca mentioned it also uh, digital epidemiology is growing rapidly and we will keep falling back on technology to do epidemiology and we'll do so more and more and we can take the approach that we say, whatever it gives us more data is better because that's we're trained. That's how we're trained as epidemiologists. But I, I think we need to have a clear understanding that to solve the problem, um, we don't necessarily always need more data. Yes, if you really wanna to get to the bottom of it and have a deep understanding, then more data is probably better. But if you just wanna solve a problem in an urgency situation, you don't necessarily need more data. So there is this trade-off, of course, between having a, an imp epidemiological impact and a preservation of privacy. But I think it's you with the right technology, you can try to push this curve you know, towards the right as much as possible. And that's what we have to do in this situation because then you can find a spot on this curve where you have you know, a good compromise of acceptable privacy risks and of a good epidemiological impact. Notice though that when you do this um, and you're the pragmatists, you will be attacked from two sides as a thank you. Um, because of course the privacy people will say, I'm sorry, but this is not the best solution from a privacy perspective. And you will be attacked on that front. And from the epidemiologists, you will be attacked because they say that's not the best solution from an epidemiological perspective. So don't expect to make any friends, but at least right, you're pragmatic and you actually uh, manage to ship stuff and get things out the door. Now, this is where I hand over to Victor. Uh, and I guess I have to stop sharing. So thank you, Marcel. And thanks also for the organizer or to the organizers for uh, letting us speak and the Swiss experience. Now, let me just I uh, start with how I came to the project because I mean, I'm, I'm not really a tech guy. I'm an epidemiologist and uh, I deal with chronic diseases. So I was um, basically joining uh, when the effort was already well underway. And I mean, it came in as in my role as um, member of the task force, the epi group where uh, Marcel is also, or used to be the, the, the group leader. And I mean, for, for, months I really felt like the dumbest guy in the room which I probably was because um, also when it came to maybe not so much about the technology but also when it came to finding out what those apps were really supposed to do and supposed to achieve I, I, it took me a long time to get my head around it and I'm still struggling sometimes 
But I think, nevertheless, um, at some point, we came together uh, as a larger team and we developed what we call the research agenda for digital proximity tracing. And uh, my experience writing down stuff really helps to, to get clarity on fundamental concepts. Because, I mean, from the very beginning, um, the big question was always, well, how do these apps really change the course of the pandemic? And um, I mean, the expectations were ranging from, well, they won't do anything to, well, they will stop the, the transmission chains altogether, etc. And the truth is usually somewhere in between. But the one thing we realized over the course of the brainstorming session or really moving along, you have to focus on the small questions first. And the small questions really start with the, the claims of what the app is supposed to do. And I think Marcel has nicely alluded to this already. The apps really have a speed advantage. So in, the, in an ideal world, they should um, notify exposed contacts faster. They should also be able to reach more exposed contacts. Um, and the thing is that both uh, elements are, ideally they should not involve human, uh, um, or they should not include human involvement. So the human is out of the loop, which means that you can make things more automatically and this gives you the speed advantage. And reaching more exposed contacts means that um, the, try next, uh, the, the person next to you in the train, which you don't really know, uh, may have gotten exposed if you are infectious, but um, in manual contact tracing, this person would not be identified as a contact. So potentially you have a wider reach um, compared to manual contact tracing. And the third claim that kind of emerged during the, the second wave, I would say these apps, especially or simply because um, human involvement is somewhat limited, at least in theory, they could act as a second line of defense. Because one thing we notice clearly is that once case numbers rose into the thousands or nearly 10,000 a day in Switzerland, manual contact tracing reached capacity limits. So they really had to focus on just getting um, index cases informed and they were not even able to follow up contacts or only in a very limited way. And so potentially that could be a niche uh, where manual or digital contact tracing can contribute. So warning, participants or, or co exposed contacts before they can be reached by manual contact tracing. So having this kind of concept of what um, these apps should achieve, we could also uh, move forward and, and basically draw an, a schematic scheme of the, the different steps. Because um, what all of you will know, and which is of course quite obvious, it's not the app that will save you or self save someone else from an infection. It's really um, people acting on the information and then people having access to healthcare resources that um, support them in, in, in cutting transmission chains. And this is illustrated by the figure here, which you will see repeatedly in my talk. Um, again, we have this person A, person B, and uh, person A gets tested. And in Switzerland, um, if there's a positive test, the health authorities, the cantonal health authorities and the manual contact tracers they should be informed within two hours. So this means that you show up on their radar and they will contact you. In the Swiss system, in the beginning, it was also uh, organized such that the COVID code, so the what we call the upload authorization code, was handed out by manual contact tracers. And that will show later how this was impacted as we entered the second wave. And um, of course, this will trigger alerts and expose contacts if um, the risk scoring uh, falls above a certain threshold. And in Switzerland, um, people with a notification essentially had three options and um, any combination of these options, but they were eligible for a free um, SARS-CoV-2 test. They were also asked to call an info line and to get advice. And they were all, of course, they could also stay uh, at home independently. So they could basically self-quarantine. Uh, what we also noticed in discussions with um, colleagues from, from other countries, they were all using different terminologies. And I think one that was particularly confusing was the different typologies for what's a key performance indicator and what's effectiveness. And that was really crucial in the beginning. So um, again, with these colleagues, we wrote a, a white paper that is now in review, where we really defined what a KPI could be. And we should also try to emphasize that those KPIs, this is not just about technology. So it's not about sensitivity of detecting a contact, et cetera. It's also about um, the speed 
uh, and, and of, of different procedures and processes that are outlined in this figure. For instance, how quickly will people be called up by manual contact tracing? How quickly do they receive a, a COVID code? They are all impacting the speed of the what we call the no, uh, exposure notification cascade. And uh, there are also input and processing and output dimensions to this KPI. Input meaning um, how many contact tracers are there, how many people can issue COVID codes, uh, server capacity, funding needed to provide everybody with a free test, stuff like that. And output is probably most closely related to effectiveness, but still not an outcome would be how many people call the info line, something like that. And it's quite important that um, you think about monitoring benchmarks or the way how to monitor these KPIs beforehand. And what is also kind of important, um, these the, 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 the apps are usually privacy preserving. So they reveal very little information about the user and the use of the apps. And this is like a big challenge in the beginning because the Swiss data or the, the Swiss data landscape is kind of very fragmented. Um, much valuable data is actually accumulated at the site of manual contact tracing. We have 26 cantons, means 26 manual contact tracing databases. Um, there were um, efforts to actually standardize those, but the job of manual contact tracing is not to collect data. They have other uh, things to handle, mainly making sure that the contacts stay in quarantine, etc. So what we also came up with, and I think this is also where um, uh, the, my location at a, at a public health institute was really handy. Uh, we identified several ongoing research studies on, on COVID-19, where we could easily inject a set of questions that are standardized and were asked in a standardized manner. Um, those studies namely were the Social Monitor, which is a private study um, organized by the, by the University of Zurich and uh, University of Applied Science Zurich. It's a national nationwide study. Um, it's a survey taking place every month or so. And also we could utilize data from the Corona Unitas project. Corona Unitas was originally designed as a zero prevalence study to find out how many people have antibodies to SARS-CoV-2, but then it also evolved into a, a, a nationwide digital cohort study. And we also have a lot of data from there. And very importantly, as a nested project within this Corona Immunity study, we had a smaller study going on within contact tracing of the Canton of Zurich. So we had actually employees uh, from the Institute on site. And whenever there was a new contact coming in, those contacts were asked whether um, it would be allowed uh, for them to, or whether they allowed the researchers to contact them and inform them about the study. So it was always with a, um, in a sense, first of all, it was informed consent, but even, Prior to contacting people, a consent was obtained. And this, um, this study, um, in the end, it enrolled about 1,000 index cases and I think, I think about 300 contacts, exposed contacts. And that was a really valuable data source, as you will also see in the course of my, uh, my talk. But as uh, Marcel has already alluded to, um, when you think about monitoring and, and how to evaluate systems, I think our, our inclination as epidemiologists is always to, to cry for more data. And what I've learned the hard way in this project is really to make the best use of existing data, and especially also to rely on data that has some, some uh, aspect of voluntariness, uh, meaning that we don't collect data from everybody, but we uh, rely on, on research studies where people have to provide informed consent. And so Swiss COVID itself is still very privacy preserving, respects anonymity, but um, by having these added research studies, we were still able to, to uh, collect some, some data that is pretty detailed. Uh, I already mentioned that there's a difference between uh, key performance indicators or monitoring parameters and effectiveness. And I mean, it's not clear cut and, and black and white, but uh, in epidemiology and the assessment of health technologies, Effectiveness evaluations usually are based on a intervention outcome relationship. So the intervention in this case will be having people being notified by the app and there should be a comparator. And the natural comparator is people who are not notified by the app, but possibly still uh, notified by manual contact tracing. And the outcome, that's a bit harder. Um, the outcome should be something of public health relevance. It could be people getting um, tested for SARS-CoV-2, could be people actually entering quarantine. And so that in combination, so the having a comparator 
and really looking at public health relevant outcomes that in my mind and in my book defines effectiveness but what you see on the left hand side is actually a typical example for a key performance indicator for monitoring so this is from the web page uh, of the federal office of statistics um, it displays um, how many um, index cases have uploaded the, the COVID code or the um, authorization upload code within two days of symptom onset. Symptom onset is something that uh, is being um, asked or is being obtained when uh, people call the info line or we get a, a COVID code. Um, so if there were symptoms, they're asked about that and this data is then taken and integrated into the COVID code, um, at least to my knowledge. And then you can measure how long it took from symptom onset until the COVID code was uploaded. And this is a number that it doesn't really tell you much about the actual impact on the public health side. But if you look at it longitudinally, it will tell you whether the system is improving or uh, basically deteriorating. And right now we are, I think, around 50, maybe 60 percent of people um, entering the COVID code within two days. At some point, it was much, much worse, as it will show. Um, in, in, in the course of my talk. But notice again here, there's no natural comparator because there's no equivalent really uh, to data that are collected at manual contact tracing. And the right-hand example is one that came out of the, this uh, court study that I mentioned, and I will explain it in, more, in greater detail soon. But what you will notice here is, um, so it's about time since exposure to entering quarantine. So it's a public health relevant endpoint, and it's a comparison uh basically between people who, who received an exposure notification and those who didn't and here we are talking about exposed contacts all of them identified by contact tracing in zurich and um so th this univariable analysis shows or uh, suggests that those who received um, an exposure notification enter quarantine one day earlier i will get back to that um but then we also need an overarching framework. I think there were two major problems initially when we started out. Um, so one is that the, the Swiss COVID apps or the, these apps in general, they're what I would call complex interventions, meaning in order for the intervention to work, to produce the desired effect, many, um, many different steps actually need to take place. And those steps are here um, in, in, the, in, in the rows or uh, labels as rows. And I would call the necessary conditions. So the, must take place for the apps to be effective. And I mean, it starts with that people download the app and use them, that COVID codes are entered, notifications are received, et cetera, and actions are leading to prevention of secondary transmission. That's really the end game. So that's the outcome that we wish to see from a public health perspective. But then we also had the problem that we need to, needed to figure out where we could find suitable data and then how to make the best use of these data. And this is what we have in the columns here. And this actually, um, this table was uh, published in, in an article that came out, I think in September, it was a, an early analysis as we called it. And this framework illustrates that you have different qualities of signals starting from early, early signal in a single data source to what I would call proof of principle. So if you see, similar signals in two independent data sources, I think that sh should illustrate that, yeah, things work. But then this is a far step away from having a reliable wallet quantification. So for instance, the monitoring uh, that I was alluding to or the, 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 the figure about time from symptom onset to um, COVID code upload, I think that we have a really good monitoring system. It's, I mean, we have time series, I think since, since uh, last November. So this is really useful. Another, a whole different story is whether the target is reached, because that also involves that you know what targets to aim for. And this is not clear for many of those parameters that are listed in the, in the rows, because we don't have a, a good reference. We have modeling studies that can be informative. For instance, um, there's, there are some numbers floating around about how, um, app adoption, so what percentage of the population should use the app, and it goes from maybe something between 25 to 50, et cetera, but with, I think, an almost uh, univocal consensus that the more app users, the more effective these apps can be. Again, um, I would like to emphasize that this is not, or not all of these indicators or performance indicators that we have here, not everything is related to comparative effectiveness, but I think we can pick out a few and try to construct effectiveness studies. And again, I would um, really focus on the three that I'm, I will also underscore them with some results. But 
is exposure notification to leading to some faster quarantine time. That's of course of high public health relevance if people who receive an exposure notification uh, move into quarantine earlier. Are uh, exposure notifications reaching more exposed contacts? Again, not a direct relation to whether uh, transmissions are prevented, but I think it's a, a good proxy at least. And then uh, on a more population level or a global level, what is then the additional contribution of EN exposure notification? And again, I think it must be very clearly stated here that exposure notifications were never intended to replace uh, manual contact tracing or to be the only measure in a health system. So I think, at least in my understanding, they were always planned as an additional tool in the toolbox. And so the contribution should be really considered an additional contribution. And um, this should be quantified ideally. And we made some attempts towards that goal. So moving to the first question, are people who receive the exposure notification entering quarantine earlier? And I think to cut a long story short, we do have some indications for that. Indications in the sense of um, people who receive an exposure notification and had non-household exposures, um, they had nominally um, smaller, a lower time to enter quarantine. So the difference was about one day. And this also held up in, in adjusted analysis. And um, so it looks good on face value. And I think there's something to it. But to be honest, it also it's more complicated than that because what we what we realized also when we started to do this analysis, and this is a um, still ongoing work, is that the context really matters. Because um, first of all, the exposure setting matters. Um, there we had an a priority notion of um, if you are exposed in a non-household setting, then possibly the apps could be more effective. Meaning that. If um, somebody, your family member uh, or a person living in the same household getting infected, then you don't really need the exposure notification in order to know, hopefully, that there was a risk. I mean, you will just talk to the person. So there are um, close lines for communication. But let's say, for instance, if you're working in a large company and you have an exposure at your workplace or a university, then, I mean, it will be harder to actually identify you as a contact and communi communication channels will be more complicated. So then manual contact tracing has to pick up that you were a contact and call you up. And usually um, a few days pass in between. So we argue that probably apps are most effective in non-household settings. But the other aspect is also, I think it's also a, a relative advantage in terms, but it may also be an absolute advantage. But uh, in terms of when I say relative advantage, I think whether ex uh, exposure notifications reach you faster than manual contact tracing are also dependent on how fast manual contact tracing can be in a, in, in a given situation. And we've had examples in Switzerland where manual contact tracing was pretty slow. And of course, then uh, exposure notifications have a time advantage. And this alludes to the third claim that um, digital proximity tracing can serve as a second line of defense if manual contact tracing gets overwhelmed. What I also need to mention here is, so we do see this, uh, this, this uh, time advantage. It's, this is all survey-based and we have not uh, been able to dissect each and every step in this survey. This is still ongoing, but what is kind of confusing um, that about eight of those 43 noticed or specifically mentioned that they received the exposure notification before they were called up by manual contact tracing. So there's an accumulation of those people in those groups, but then you still have a few where manual contact tracing was first and then exposure notifications happened second. So the mixture is still a bit blurry, but uh, the picture is still a bit blurry, but overall I think we are getting closer and we are doing additional analysis, but it's a starting point I would say. Now analysis number two is actually a totally different approach. And here we were dealing with data from a survey that has been going on for about a year or so. And we have 15 follow-up waves. These people are asked similar questions, um, have been asked similar questions about the use of proximity tracing apps, also about uh, being, or being in quarantine, having tested positive. And this is an approach that uh, was also inspired by discussions with the MIT PACT group. So they're proposing these Venn diagrams. And I think they're a very good tool actually to dissect the contributions and different subpopulations um, in a cross-sectional way. And it's informative for two reasons, I will get to that. But first, when you look at the, uh, at the yellow circle, 
So there's a total of 46 people who had over the course of about four months, a positive test out of 2,403 individuals that we followed up. And um, you see that some were falling into different segments. One is the C segment and the C is the most important one because that's the intersect between people testing positive, people being sent into quarantine and people, people receiving an app warning. And then you have the D segment, which are people who uh, did not receive an exposure notification. And based on these segments, you can then proceed to um, define additional measures, additional outcome indicators, as I would call them. And for instance, one that is kind of interesting is also when you look at test positivity among those who have an EN, an exposure notification. So uh, the, um, the, the, the six alludes to um, the, the C segment. So those are the six people who tested positive. And then the 20 are the different segments. Um, you, I will actually allude you to a, to a preprint or refer to a preprint later um, where you can Add, accumulate these segments, and so it's B, uh, sorry, C, F1, E1. If you count them together, you arrive at the 20. And test positivity was about 30% here, which is really high. And I'm getting questions about it all the time because I've shared this preprint, and it's kind of puzzling. But at the same time, I would argue that even though it's about three times test positivity, as in the in the wild among other um, populations, this could actually be indicative that exposure notifications are picking up some real exposure risks. So this is also something we're looking into. And again, I would not say that this uh, question is solved, but I think it's a very interesting indication. And we have been able to, to um, detect that, or at least to build a hypothesis based on the Venn, based, uh, the Venn diagram based approach. And what the Venn diagrams also reveal is that there are quite a few populations or segments, especially E1 and E2, so those people who only received an app warning, they would never really appear in any of the Swiss statistics. So having this cross-sectional population-based approach also allows us to get a rough estimate uh, of how many people may no, not show up in any testing statistics or, or not calling the, the info line, etc. but maybe they still respond to the notifications. So again, that's another question that we should follow up at some point. And of course, there are some caveats. This is all self-report. And I mean, it's amazing that even though we have 7,000 plus follow-up server responses, it's still, when you look at those numbers, they're still pretty small. But again, it's, there's a picture emerging here. Now, a third project, actually, that was a, it's one of the older ones here. We try to aggregate all this information and try to figure out what's the public health impact of all the information that we have. And again, it's the same sequence of events, the notification cascades, and we try to do some kind of a back calculation, as I would call it. So we have statistical information on the number of info line calls. Um, there are some data around of how many people also noted that Swiss COVID triggered them or, uh, or who, who recorded Swiss COVID as a reason to get tested. Those data are no longer available, unfortunately. But um, we did have that data for some time. And based on that, as long as uh, along the lines with or combined with other information that are standing from monitoring, we try to recreate the cascade for the Canton of Zurich. And we use the Canton of Zurich because exactly we do have that information, for instance, from the embedded cohort study, but also from the social monitor, etc. So that kind of gave us a, an approximation of what was going on. And I think I would like to allude you to the one result that I found most interesting, which is that about 170 persons out of 722 callers, uh, or maybe 10% of those alerted roughly, they uh, received the re quarantine recommendation. And in uh, Swiss COVID, the, rec recommend, uh, the quarantine recommendations were quite strict. So the, the people at manning the, the info line, they had a script and they did some additional triage and only about one in five uh, persons received that recommendation. But if you compare it to the number of people who entered mandatory quarantine, it, it's the equivalent of about 5%. And in an ideal world, one could argue that those 5%, they may actually reflect the additional contribution uh, of uh, exposure notifications to, to quarantine. So it's the 100% mandatory quarantine and ideally 5% in addition, assuming that there's no overlap. So those people who had a voluntary quarantine recommendation did not also receive a mandatory quarantine recommendation. But I think this is a one indication of what's going on. And of course you can say, 
well, it's not that much. But again, um, working off the premise that apps are really a complementary tool to manual contact tracing, I think in, in depending on the situation, 5% may not be so little. It could actually have a real impact. But we also learned the hard way that especially during the second wave that not everything worked so smoothly. And this is based on a media analysis where we screened uh, statements of different stakeholders, including people from the federal authorities or cantonal authorities to find out where some problems in the non-technical implementation may lie. And we found out about bottlenecks that uh, Marcel has already alluded to. COVID codes were handed out late or not at all during the second wave because manual contact tracing who was responsible for providing COVID codes was uh, overwhelmed, basically. We noticed a lot of unmet uh, communication needs and maybe also distorted expectations by different actors. So the system was very new. People needed to find out how to adapt to the system or how the system should be adapted to their needs. There were also fears of resource competition for time and money. So I think initially, um, People at contact tracing were not, excited, not really excited about the prospect of having Swiss COVID because their needs in terms of monitoring were totally different. And I think they were also a bit um, disappointed that the system is so privacy preserving, but hopefully um, they, they also realized that Swiss COVID can actually make a relevant contribution. And on the other hand, also the unclear effectiveness, I think has also hurt adoption. And I mean, that's like the vicious cycle. So we came out with the app and people were waiting for the app to be effective, but some were actually waiting uh, until the effectiveness data were out. So it's you have to break this cycle. And um, obviously we have tried to communicate the findings as they emerged also with the scientific community. And I think also very importantly, compliance uh, um, is really important. I mean, people, again, as I said, it's not the app itself that triggers the public health response. It's people actually responding to the, to the, to the information so that they are more cautious, that they uh, get tested, et cetera. And we also found that some of the incentives were really misaligned. I think still now, uh, if, a people, if a person is actually sent into quarantine by manual contact tracing, they're eligible for salary compensation. I think this is still not the case for uh, digital proximity tracing. And just those things need to be considered carefully. I also mentioned that uh, we had a pretty bad experience during the second wave. And I think this is uh, what I'm showing here. Now, what you can see in this figure is the weekly ratio of uploaded COVID codes per new case. Um, so basically it's a division of the number of COVID codes per week over the number of new SARS-CoV-2 cases. And I'm saying a ratio because it's, I'm trying to emphasize that um, it's not that COVID well, let me put it this way. I think it's a pretty good indicator because it shows how many people um, are actually, or who may be using the app and, and in terms of what a potential impact of the app could be. And you see here two lines, one ending in November and one ending in, in January, 2021. And uh, November, um, the, the, the first line was really the peak of the, um, the pandemic, the second wave, as you can only also, also see uh, in the blue line. And you see how the COVID codes, the end to COVID codes um, per week really came down. And so it was a, a double whammy here. So because COVID codes were not delivered and at the same time we had many more cases. So this triggered this dip. And I think also in, in, the, in the public perception, this really led to quite a bit of a disappointment because um, then people felt, well, why am I using the app if COVID codes arrive so late? But I think this also triggered a reaction from, um, from the people responsible for the app, namely Federal Office of Public Health, but also the steering committee. And you see how this ratio recovered basically. What is a little bit puzzling is that this ratio is going down. We are still not sure what this is showing, but I think it's an important um, indicator to monitor. And you see again, how this a little bit, at least in the, in the first phase corresponded to um, to the, to the incidents. And I think this is something to watch out for, also for people operating the, the, the systems and the notification cascades. A second one here is um, timeliness. And timeliness, again, can be measured by the time passed between symptom onset and upload of COVID code or contacts calling the info line within, within two days of exposure. This is also information that is available from the, from the info line. So they ask for that information. And 
I mean, again, to cut a long story short, we had a dip uh, in, in November, but then I think um, the numbers look a bit more encouraging. So you see how that they're relatively stable. So we have been above 50% for the cases uploading COVID code. So this means that probably um, getting a COVID code is no longer such a big problem like as it used to be in November. And But again, it's something to watch out for. And of course, you shouldn't... Um, place too much money on the on the last data points because this is still evolving but um we have to monitor that trend at the same time also contacts calling info line that a number has also been or that ratio has also been quite stable something to monitor here but overall i think what this uh figure also illustrates in the previous one the context really matters so whenever you we, you analyze and evaluate a um, digital proximity tracing tool you need to take context into account. And context is, first of all, um, the technical aspects or the risk scoring, um, also the, the procedures uh, in the notification cascade, the incidents, and this is really a moving target, uh, I think. And uh, Luca Ferretti may also tell a story because their analysis also, uh, I think, was dealing with different risk scoring schemes and changes in the system. So this is one piece of advice. Uh, maybe make sure in which setting and time frame your analysis happened and don't assume that this will be constant. So it should be evaluated on a more uh, continuous basis. Now, before I close, I would like to come back to the summary and this table that I introduced in the beginning. And I think it's, it's uh, one way to illustrate where we stand here. So I think overall for the, the conditions one, two, three, I think we have a pretty good understanding of where we are. Uh, those are the preconditions people need to upload and download the app, uh, sorry, download the app and use it also actively. We have monitoring about 77,000 codes, copy codes or upload authorization keys have been entered. And about uh, this is, corresponds to about 70% of all issued codes. And I think also in the UK, it was found that not every issued code was entered because this is still a voluntary step. Um, then we have about 38% um, of manual contact tracing identified contacts. They were using the exposure or did the app or even more were using the app, but about 38% actually had exposure notifications. So we see in a data set that was collected at contact tracing that um, those with exposure notifications do show up. So I think there we have at least proof of principle. It's hard to measure nationwide because that would mean we would uh, that would require consistent data on exposure notifications from manual contact tracing from all cantons. But I think we have a pretty good understanding that those, pe those people, they do show up on the radar of manual contact tracing as well. But the Venn diagram analysis has also shown that there are some people out there who um, may not show up in the systems at all. Um, notifications lead to desired action. So again, I think I would the main action to be taken, I would argue, is um, getting a quarantine or following quarantine recommendations or getting tested. So those are the things that exposed contact should really do. And I think those are the, mon the main elements to be monitored. And finally, um, actions lead to prevention of secondary transmission. I mean, the way this is worded, this already alludes to causality. So we, ideally, in an ideal world, we would like to know whether uh, exposure notifications lead to prevention of, of further transmissions, et cetera. And I think that's uh, hard not to crack, as I would say. I think we're, we're getting there. And for that, we need uh, data that is of fine granularity. We really need to study the sequence of events. And again, this is one of the, 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 um, the, the priorities uh, currently when we look at the, the data from the embedded cohort. So I think this is a, an important element also from a scientific viewpoint, but also to report back to the public and this is different from the population impact. So I think here, the data that we have is maybe a bit less focused on population impact than evaluations from other countries. But I think having the opportunity of uh, longitudinal data gives us the, the option to, to look at the sequence of events and really try to understand how people respond in which order. And I think that's a very important element also to optimize and improve um, the overall exposure notification cascade. Sorry, I just uh, stopped here. Uh, that was actually by mistake. I wanted to show, can you still see my screen? I wanted to show some, uh, some, some conclusions here, take home messages. I think in the beginning also within Switzerland, it was important to discuss what these apps should actually do, how we should monitor them. 
I mean, did, I think also Joanna Mazel in another talk has alluded to that this is a highly interactive exercise, highly interdisciplinary exercise, and it took us quite some time to sort that out. We have published many of those studies and efforts, but uh, also make sure that everybody has the same understanding of what different terms and expressions mean. And also monitoring systems are really important. Put them in place while or even before you implement exposure notification apps and leverage existing research data and other administrative data. So you don't need data that comes directly out of the app. So maybe you can actually leverage other studies and then create synergies. And this is certainly what I would call had a sa what has saved us here in Switzerland. And there is some evidence that infected cases got tested or entered quarantine. And I'm specifically using the word because I mean, we have reports, narrations from people um, where this happened. The big challenge is the quantification uh, of how many, how many times that has happened and also um, what the public health impact is. But then in the situation we are currently in, I would argue that every prevented or every broken transmission chain is valuable. So I think I would still argue that the Swiss COVID is making a relevant contribution, even though the numbers may not seem extremely high. But what is also to be borne in mind is that the challenges for effectiveness, there are more on the non-technical side, I would argue. So we saw that in principle, the, act, the, the technical side works quite well, but the bottlenecks came from uh, people not responding in time to certain requests, like handing out COVID codes, misaligned incentives, so people have no motivation of you for using the app. And I mean, those are really points, action points where optimizations could be achieved. And I would also say that, or and, the Federal Office of Public Health has undertaken quite a bit of efforts and that really, in my view, has managed to improve the system by quite a bit. And of course, this is continuous work, but I think we are uh, in a better situation than we were at the beginning of the second wave. And so I am keep re repeating myself. I think the contribution is relevant. So let's agree on that, because again, we do see that it has an impact. It may not seem small, but um, every broken transmission chain counts in my feeling. Now, I thank you for your attention, and I would also like to mention the many collaborators that are here. Um, I would also emphasize, so in principle, I, I don't have a real conflict of interest in the sense of I have no stakes, financial interests, etc. But I do have a small uh, mandate by the Swiss Federal Office of Public Health, which, but most of the work that I've shown uh, happened in my, not in my spare time, but was not funded by, by any foundation. But the studies uh, where we got data from, they have received data also from the Federal Office of Public Health, Health Promotion Switzerland, um, and different other foundations. And I would like to thank, of course, all my collaborators, my colleagues, and uh, all the foundations who have contributed directly or indirectly to making this work happen. And I stop here and hand over to Marcel again. Thanks. Um... Yeah, we're almost coming up to the hour, so I can go back to the slides, but I will have to race through them. Um, and I guess that's fine, um, but I'll, I'll go super quickly. So um, what we've basically just talked about, right, was forward proximity tracing, um, because it's based on proximity tracing and it's looking forward into the transmission chain. You have an infected case and you say, hmm, who could that person have um, infected? Suggestion is to bring decentralized QR code functionality into this app um, so that we can do both um, forward proximity tracing as before, but also forward as well as backwards, what we call presence tracing. This is to identify clusters based on this notion that um, proximity is not all there is to, um, to transmission, especially for large scale clusters, which clearly are largely driven by aerosol transmission. So basically these two differences could be in this, these two approaches could be in the same app, right? Proximity tracing, presence tracing, where again, in one case, you would talk about close contacts and forward. In the other, you would talk about presence, cluster identification, forward and backward tracing. And so again, right? Forward tracing is you start with infected people and you ask, you ask whom did they infect and backward tracing, you just go back and you ask, where did they get infected? I mean, of course, in principle, you could ask whom did they get infected by, but the, the really important question is where did that happen? So you can identify these um, 
locations and moments of concern. Proposed protocol originally, as I mentioned, was DP3T for proximity tracing. For presence tracing, we developed a new protocol which is called Crowd Notifier. Um, it's been up since October um, on GitHub. The implemented protocol, of course, at the end of the day, um, required Google and Apple's uh, goodwill for DP3T that turned into exposure notification. For Crowd Notifier, that's not necessary, although, of course, there's an important caveat. Um, so we built a demo app initially in Switzerland. We called it One Step Ahead. In this case, the demo app is called Notify Me. And so this One Step Ahead became Swiss COVID. And um, the idea is to now integrate Notify Me into Swiss COVID so that Swiss COVID becomes Swiss COVID too. So if you need more information about this app, here's the website. Um, you can check it out, but it's basically a very simple um, system, right? So it's also decentralized. So it has similar privacy preservation um, uh, philosophies built in, data stays on phones. And again, this also could scale in, in, the, in the way that uh, Victor mentioned. Um, so you know, it's essentially a check-in system, as you now already increasingly know or hear from also many other places. It keeps a diary of where you've been, but that diary is just very local. And so the, the, the trick here is to have two um, entry codes, right? Where one is the public code that you scan and then you, it, it tells you, okay, I'm in this meeting and you can sort of set, right? Check-in times and so on. I mean, this is all UX, I can, it's just a demo app here. And then you have this other um, QR code that's associated with this event or this location that as the event organizer, you can then eventually activate or, you know, as the, as, the, um, as the public health authority, that's also an implementation question. But then once that's triggered, the people who have a, a connection to this other, uh, who have scanned the corresponding private code will get the alert. Um, this is something we have been um, testing at EPFL for some time now. Um, we are currently evaluating also the implications of the recent rejection by Google and Apple to accept the updated NHS um, app. Um, and you know, the, this, 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 the things we can discuss about that. Um, it is, of course, the, the key point there, if I understand the situation in the UK correctly, um, is one can of course scan these QR codes and then eventually say, oh, there, you know, public health can then say, oh, there was something here about this particular location that makes me nervous. We should probably let people know and then, you know, ask them to get tested. So you activate this, this um, private code, QR code of the event. But an even more efficient system would be where people who have been positively tested and you know this in Swiss COVID and I guess in the NHS COVID app as well, because that the information is entered into the app. You can then also ask people to upload um, the list or some list, right, of, of their um, codes. And so then you can, do by, by a simple sort of prioritization system, you can automatically figure out, hey, a lot of people who were at this particular event have actually uploaded codes or so have been positively tested after. So it's probably time to now trigger that event and that really could help you with cluster identification. And so there's a question how to do that, right? Without um, disclosing sensitive information, which is of course um, a key aspect. So this is something you know that's ongoing and we hope to have clarity about that pretty soon. So again, right, it's the, it's the backward tracing here. Good, um, yeah, so I think I can stop here. I mean, obviously we would like to do this in Swiss COVID for obvious reasons. I mean, there's all the goodwill and people know the brand, etc. cetera. Um, I don't think I have to go into this. I can stop here in the interest of time. Stop. Good. So who's who's managing the the, the questions? So Luca is managing. Luca is managing the questions. It, it was great to hear about crowd notifier as well. Um, may I start with a question on on this aspect? So, 
what is your point of view on the on the rejection by the by Google and Apple of the NHS app developments on so what what could be the potential impact on Cloudifier? Well, I, I think I mean the the, the biggest um, the biggest um, impact I think it could have is clarification, right? Um, I mean, we have at the moment limited understanding. I have limited understanding for um, the exact reasons um, for which the the, um, the app was rejected. I mean, I heard the official answer, but that there is no notion of what code was actually submitted. Um, um, and so, and so, it's uh, it's it's pure guessing. I mean, at the end of the day, I think the official answer is correct, and that if you're not careful in what kind of information you let users upload, you potentially um, disclose information that is not quite as privacy preserving anymore. And that, of course, you want to definitely avoid. So I'm. I don't know exactly um, what was submitted, but I think this can be done in a way that um, that it is in agreement with with those boundary conditions imposed by Apple and Google, which you know we would support certainly. Then there are many questions from Rafi Yalom. <laughs> uh, we could probably let him ask the questions himself let me let me ask, thank you thank you very much marcel and uh, victor excellent work excellent presentation i'll be brief and sorry for flooding the uh, q a channel uh, 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 let me just ask one quick question uh, regarding the current thoughts and policies for an exposure notification for users who are um, vaccinated as well as uh, thoughts in, in swiss COVID about relaxing the requirements for uh, positive test verification to support things like home testing, what's what's the thought, and how do you actually, you know, make that determination? Given the fact that there is no direct feedback loop to determine how the positivity rate, you know, is going to be affected. Um, so, any any thoughts on that would be great. Thanks again. Um, Marcel, yeah. you want to Victor, you want to take this or? Okay. Well, I mean, so I can really, uh, I'm really um, privy to to the discussions that happen at the steering committee but at least in the in the community of researchers that i was uh, talking to i think there's not much i don't think there's a plan to change um, the, the scoring etc because of the vaccination campaign etc so i mean as you say a side effect of, of being more liberal with testing etc and then providing vaccines we are losing a little bit of more data points and, and control over what's going on in terms of uh, monitoring but overall, I think even if people get vaccinated, they shouldn't change their behavior. And I think Swiss COVID would still stay relevant and uh, they should still be using the app. But I don't know whether this is a message that will be promoted by the Federal Office of Public Health. I hope so. But maybe more so you have more insights here. I'm not sure whether I've addressed your question, Rafi. I, I don't have more insight, but I agree. I mean, I, I guess vaccinated people will change the behavior. I think that's unavoidable. And to some extent, of course, that's exactly the goal, right, <laughs> of the vaccination is that we can, again, eventually change our behaviors back to, to what it was before. But I'm, I'm with Victor there. I mean, from the perspective of, the, of me still potentially being infectious, even though that we now know to be rather you know, rare, probably, well, Right then, we don't care whether you've been vaccinated or not. And from a pure um, uh, infect, uh, getting infected point of view, I mean, I think it's still good to get an alert that you have been um, exposed. I mean, Switzerland has always handled this in a way that it essentially left everything to the user to make a decision what to do with this alert. And I think the same the same would apply to uh, you know if you've been vaccinated maybe be a bit more careful and um or maybe again get tested but um yeah i also wouldn't change the, the recommendations immediately with respect to the test i mean that's of course a bigger problem especially since we've now rolled out these free tests to the entire population right every everyone living in switzerland can get five do at home tests for free every month so that's you know about one test um, a week and um, and you do these tests, and 
nobody really asks any questions. And if you're positive, you're simply asked to go um, uh, get um, con have that confirmed with a PCR test, and then you would enter into the system. Now, it is possible that people are getting um, doing these self tests at home, and they see it's positive, and they just stay at home. They're not actually going to get a confirmation, which also will mean that they will not get the codes, which means they will not activate the app. How that will play out in terms of the dynamics, we don't know yet. Great, thank you very much. I think I will just uh, read the, just two questions to, to cut it short. Uh, one for uh, Marcel uh, from Paul Evier de Aire. Uh, so what about uh, uh, the, the kind of, in, of uh, interactions between uh, the kind of manual backward testing solutions in terms of venues and digital ones. Yeah, I mean, I think same as with with proximity tracing, right? I mean, it's it's a it's a question of assistance, and that's something you know. You, I'm sure, you remember from from the, the spring last year, right? We've been we've been philosophically pretty strict on that one, and we can of course debate whether that's actually that was the right call or not. But where we said we're not reinventing the wheel, we're, we basically just want to support what is happening um, with digital means for all the reasons that we mentioned earlier in the talk, but in particular for speed. And so, um, yeah, I would say the, the exact same thing for presence tracing. I mean, it's something that should just make everyone's lives a little easier and support um, the, the traditional contact tracing um, rather than replace it. And then one last question, I think for probably for Victor. So, uh, uh, so inputting codes uh, is always a tricky, a tricky bottleneck for the app. So, what do you think is the main gap uh, there right now, and what can be done? Uh, so, is it a big problem in Switzerland right now, and do you think it can be improved? So the importing, getting the code, I think, is no longer such a big issue because um, the response of the FOPH was to have um, different providers for those COVID codes. Basically, any physician can generate those codes. And uh, we also have the info line still in place. And people are actually directed at, to the info line if they do not receive the code within a certain amount of time. Marcel, I think it's one day, two days. So I think this has alleviated the bottleneck quite a bit, yeah. And so that was also a little bit what I was trying to allude to, um, maybe with the two final slides. So some of the most important key parameters have remained stable, even though um, in the late, uh, latest weeks, the incidence was rising. So this is a little bit of a good sign, but of course, I think the real stress test may still yet to come with the third wave. So it, it remains to be seen. Yeah, I mean, if I can jump in, and I think Carmela already said the same in this form here. This is where I think we we should have the better solution would have been to do something like you did in the UK. I think there, we, as I mentioned, right, we overestimated um, the how easy this would be to hand out codes because of all the things we considered. This seemed like such a trivial part. For me, that's a huge learning lesson, right? We always talk about this stuff in terms of, oh, you know, um, here are, are the technological solutions. And, and, you know, not falling into this trap of tech solutionism. I mean, I think there was a lot of, of this um, talk which was not very helpful at the time. We really wanted to contribute something digitally that would help the existing infrastructure. But then we, we I think we were not, sufficiently putting ourselves in the shoes of the people that they would then have to work with the system. And we underestimated the difficulty for them to hand out codes. So next time, right, that should, that should that's probably something we'll, we'll think more deeply about. And so I would like to thank a lot both speakers for their great talks. And uh, again, uh, thanks, Victor. Thanks, Marcel. And thanks for all your hard work on the, on the Swiss app and on uh, the centralized protocols.
I hope that this will uh, th this will come out uh, as something that will uh, will be more and more helpful in the future because I, I perfectly get that decentralized protocols are the way to go and that uh, we need to have them ready for the next pandemic as well hopefully the, hopefully also for this one but <laughs> yeah. one uh, one has to be uh, optimistic and thanks to uh, all the uh, all the ones who connected to uh, to this seminar to listen and i remind you that there will be another uh, round of uh, app uh, evaluation next month from the german app that would that should be also another very interesting learning experience and thanks thanks everybody and have a nice evening or day if you're in the us thank you thank you